Don't be scared to be great. Go after one of these three QBs. Welcome to the Locked On Vikings podcast. You are Locked On Vikings, your daily Minnesota Vikings podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's going on, everybody? Welcome to the Locked On Vikings podcast, where we're always trying to learn something new. It's part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And thank you so much for making Locked On Vikings your first listen of the day each and every day. Those of you who are my hashtag everydayers who have been around this whole draft season, I appreciate you all very much. Going to be kind of a review episode from a lot of stuff we've talked about over the last couple of months. So if you have been around every day, I appreciate you so very much. But, you know, this this one might be a little bit uh, repetitive. Consider it a review sesh before the final. Uh, and if you are new, hello, welcome. This one's kind of for you. Uh, if you haven't been around for the last two months, I'll re- review and recap some of the th- things we've been talking about with uh, some of the main quarterbacks the Vikings are, should be, probably are, maybe are targeting in the draft. So buckle up for that. You can find this show wherever you find your favorite podcasts, whether it's an audio listening app like Sirius XM or uh, YouTube or Amazon Fire and Roku. Just download the Locked On Minnesota Sports app. Today's episode is brought to you by Monopoly Go. If you have a competitive side and you want to bury your friends and shame their families, you can get Monopoly Go, the mobile hit twist on classic Monopoly. Join your friends and download Monopoly Go, now free on the App Store or Google Play. So here's how I want to do this today. Uh, If the Vikings trade up, there are three quarterbacks that it will be like it, it. There is no world in which they trade up. And it's not one of these three names. Um, JJ McCarthy, Drake may Jaden Daniels. Those are the three guys that if they trade up, whether it's three to four to five, who's available, whatever, that's, that's where you get into all the permutations of all the situations. We talked about that on Monday. Um, but we didn't do a lot of like the actual evaluation on those guys. So I want to talk about those three guys today and sort of do a review, a recap, a little bit of a cram for exams. If you haven't been around, uh, and you haven't really been plugged in and you want to catch up real quick, this one is for you or if you are just good to kind of review uh, and and get your bearings again. But I want to get into some of the nitty gritty with some of these guys. And I think the guy, I think the guy that the Vikings are targeting most is Drake May. At least that's the way I read the tea leaves in terms of what reports I believe and what I don't believe. Uh, it feels like the Drake May stuff is real and that they like him a lot. And there have been a lot of think pieces running around lately about other QBs, about these QBs um, that, you know, a lot of this is what I've been hearing from executives and stuff like that. A lot of smoke rolling around everywhere. But it's been a pretty consistent theme throughout the entirety of the draft process that the Vikings really like Drake May and some variation of they're going to offer something insane to try to get him or even some people uh in in places like i think there's an albert breer column some time ago charles robinson at yahoo did a column that was like yeah i think they're just gonna get him like people being just super convinced that like yeah they're gonna find a way to pull this off they want it really bad uh and and it would be about drake may so whether or not you believe that or whether or not that optimism is founded that's i guess a question we'll answer on thursday but in terms of who drake may is as a quarterback let's start there um uncqb He spent 2023 in a new offense to him. Uh, And so there were some growing pains there. But if you have never watched Drake May play, I want you to envision a Josh Allen vibe. It's look, it's a comp I don't hate. It's, of course, you know, comparisons to current pros are always going to be a little lazy. He's a different guy, but they do have some things in common. They're like big quarterbacks that like to scramble and run around and make chaos plays. Um, It's very along the same lines as Caleb Williams, uh, who will just will be a bear. So there's not much reason to talk about him. We, I will actually touch on him tomorrow when I talk about some of the other, like some unlikely guys. We'll, we'll, we'll mention him. But um, for now, with May, it's very like he thrives on chaos. And almost to the point where it kind of feels like he's more comfortable throwing on the move than he is throwing from just like from the pocket. Um or, you know, especially once he's got to move around, resetting his base instead of stopping, resetting your feet and delivering a ball comfortably. Uh, even if he has time to do that, he'll still sort of opt for that throw on the move because he throws it really, really well on the move. It's one of my favorite things about him is how well he throws on the move. 
Uh, and so he has this really cool scramble drill that is, you know, properly, uh, properly executed. But that's not the way things were drawn up in UNC. That's like what happens when things start going wrong. The way it was drawn up, like th this new offense, it was very pre-snap reedy. Uh, it was very quick gamey. And we did see get to see plenty of, of examples of Drake May in his drop back footwork. And it's great. The way he actually drops back when, when there's no pressure, when there's no nothing like that. And it's just, you know, rhythm, throw, deliver the ball on time, on the body, on the break. Uh, awesome at that. Absolutely love it. That when I watched, there were a couple of high misses. I couldn't see an obvious mechanical issue for that. I think he would just get kind of excited and put too much heat on it sometimes. And that's certainly something you can live with. Uh, probably, you know, that's like, it didn't have to happen often enough where it would be like an issue to his evaluation. Um, and there were a lot of problems within that plan up front of like busted protections in particular. And that's something that's worth flagging both because yeah, okay, there's a lot of pressure. So he's dealing with pressure. But to me, that's context for a given play. But if you, if you, you only really need to look at like the volume of pressure, if you're making like a statistical judgment and you have to like adjust that stat for pressure. But, but for what I'm looking at, I'm looking at a given play, right? And if there's pressure on the play, it's context for that play. But really the more pressure that is, that just means I get to see him under pressure more and I get to evaluate that part of his game more or less. And then, you know, how much of his game is dropped back. But what is worth flagging is the reason for pressure uh, sometimes it was just busted protections. Now I could never get a straight answer on this with uh, with with UNC's offense of how responsible Drake May was for calling protections at the line. But if he was calling protections at the line, there was a lot of stuff in the front that he wasn't seeing, and that could be a genuine concern. Um, if he wasn't responsible for calling protections at the line, that's not that uncommon. Um, I, I don't think that it's the default state and most quarterbacks do it. So I, I would guess that he was, but if he wasn't, that's not the craziest thing in the world. Uh, and certainly a lot of young QBs in the NFL don't, don't call protections. You'll leave that up to the center, especially if you have a veteran center like Garrett Bradbury, who knows how to do it. You can take that off of his plate, off of his brain. He can focus on the coverage and the pass play and all that stuff. One less thing to think about. There can be advantages to that, but something worth flagging and, um, you know, keeping in mind, even though we don't have a really like clean answer to it. Um, so when it comes to pressure, Drake May is, is what I'll call like an internal clock player. There are players who, who run on a, on a rhythm, who run on, you know, okay, I hit my drop back, you know, one Mississippi, two Mississippi, three Mississippi, I gotta go. And whether or not there's pressure, they'll go. Early in Kirk Cousins' time with the Vikings, he did this. And he started to transition, I think with, with O'Connell especially, he would transition into a more field-based version of it, where it wasn't like one Mississippi, two Mississippi go. It was actually using your perif peripheral vision to examine if pressure is coming or not and responding to like uh, either, you know, flashes of color or responding to just that kind of eyes in your back of the head, in the back of your head kind of thing. Feel those footsteps. Having that game feel is a really difficult thing to teach that some guys do have and some guys don't. And I think it's something that Kirk was trying to develop in his last couple of years here and probably still will in Atlanta. Um, like something he would like genuinely be working on. And you can even see the way that like they drilled. Uh, I remember a couple of times like noting that at camp that they were like really working that sort of that that feel for it. It's really difficult to describe, but I don't want to waste too much time on it because there's so much else uh, to talk about. But but maybe this is a good chance to go into the 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 comfortable on the run thing. And maybe my biggest issue with Drake made this I've talked about ad nauseum. But basically, when it is time to move uh, for one, I do think he's a little overreactive to like flashes of color. Um, but when it is time to move he takes too big of steps. That's the, the simplest way to put it. And, and the way to fix that is to, to drill his footwork to keep his, his feet wide as he moves around in the pocket. Because if you narrow your feet, you're going to take a longer step. And if you take a longer step, eventually you get outside of the tackles. And then the tackles don't have an angle to block anymore. And they're just not helping. You're just bringing pressure onto yourself. Um, so keep those feet a little bit wider. Take smaller, shuffleier steps when you're going into... Uh, when, when you're trying to work the pocket, you'll have a lot more control over where you are. Uh, and then, you know, you're not going to bring those same issues onto yourself. This was also something that uh, Will Levis struggled with that really like brought a lot of pressure onto himself. So it's definitely not the first time I've seen that in a guy. One thing that I noticed, like if I were a DC preparing for Drake May, 
I would run all kinds of contained stunts. That means edges crashing inside, D tackles looping outside because they would flash color. And I think he would react poorly to that. And then you have somebody containing him um, to his, especially to his his right side, to the defense's left, to not his blind side because that's going to be where he wants to run. Um, you know, if you put somebody containing out there, I think you can cause some problems for him early. And that's the kind of thing that I think you you uh, you, you got to work out of him a little bit. And it might be the kind of thing that keeps him off the field right away, which isn't an issue to me at all. Uh, you, you may take your time with that, right? Go develop the way you have to. But there is just this chaos thing. That's really the draw of him. These, you know, cross body or these like on the run, wing it 40 yards downfield to an open guy, like find the play kind of thing. But it unfortunately comes kind of stapled to a bozo gene with really, really dumb interceptions that uh, sort of, you know, you got to take with the good with the bad. And I will for him. I'm happy to do that with him. And I'm really, really high on Drake May for that reason. There's a couple of things that I think could be cleaned up, but I love Drake May. Uh, and, and I think that, even though I don't know if he is going to be the best QB day one, he absolutely has every chance in the world to be the best QB that comes out of this class. Like that outcome, super available. So if the Vikings could come away with him, it's a coup. And I've been pretty vocal about not really caring if it costs them a lot of draft picks because that's your QB. And if you get your QB, it's going to paper over those that lack of resources real easy, especially when you already have Justin Jefferson in the building. So... Uh, next up, we'll talk about, uh, well, let's do Jaden Daniels next and then we'll wrap things out with, uh, JJ McCarthy. Today's episode is brought to you by eBay motors. Look, your car is an extension of who you are. It is your personality. It's your lifestyle. It gets you from point A to point B, gets you, you know, to and from work or school. Uh, but it also, it's, it's like part of how you express yourself, the way you keep it, the way you express it. So whether it is, uh, something cosmetic like led headlights or superchargers or roof racks or something, uh, under the hood to make it work for whatever you need to do with that car, check out eBay motors. They have 122 million parts for your number one ride or die. And you will always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay guaranteed fit, the part is guaranteed to fit your ride every single time. Cause your ride is not my ride. It's not anybody else's ride. It's yours, your make and model. And that's going to come with whatever parts are compatible for it. That can be really difficult to navigate. So the eBay guaranteed fit ensures that it's taken care of with all of the parts you need at the prices you want. It's easy to take care of your car the way that your car deserves it. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. eBay guaranteed fit only available to U.S. customers. Thanks a million for making Lockdown Vikings your first listen of the day. Look, we haven't done a lot of mock drafts here on Lockdown Vikings. Uh, and if you're interested in one, why don't you go to the Locked On NFL mock draft? It's on the Locked On NFL draft feed, whether that's YouTube or, or the podcast feed. Search it out wherever you listen to stuff. Uh, and you can find all 32 of us locked on hosts getting together and doing a mock draft together. Trades enabled. Negotiations went wild all over the place. Uh, and you can see who exactly went where and just how successful I was at trying to get up for a quarterback like potentially Jaden Daniels. Uh, Jaden Daniels is up next. Here's the thing. And I don't want you to quote me too hard on this because it's very loosey goosey. Uh, there are like, like there's the the top three QBs in this class. It's Caleb Williams, Drake Maiden, and Jaden Daniels. And everybody's got them in some order. Most people have Caleb Williams at number one. Not all of them do. Most of them do. I'm one of the people who doesn't, but it's like very loose. So if you disagree with me, if you think Caleb is number one and I'm insane for not having him number one, I'm not going to argue with you. That's totally fine. It's all overlapping bell curves, right? Every, all of the outcomes, you know, big giant, you know, big fat middle of the Venn diagram. It's okay. So everybody relax. But that said, I actually have Jaden Daniels as the one that I would be most excited to root for if my team drafted him because of what I think he does in, um, in, in the pocket is of all of these quarterbacks, the most like Sunday, the most pro style to me, um, but I think that probably buries the lead about Jaden Daniels. The first thing about Jaden Daniels you have to know is that he can house it scrambling. Some of this was against the Florida Gators, which barely counts. But, um, you know, SEC defenses, right? Uh, and and they, they earned a lot of man coverage, which is actually kind of crazy because they had, like, good receivers. Right? You know, I mean, they have, like, Brian Thomas and uh, Malik Neighbors are both 
going to be first rounders in all likelihood. So kind of crazy that they saw as much man coverage as they did, but whenever it was man coverage and Jaden Daniels got out of the pocket, he could take off and he could, he could generate an explosive play so much so that it kind of became a crutch. Um, and he's an eyedropper. That's the way I, I, I will put it because guys who scramble a lot might not necessarily be a problem. There are Lamar Jackson's in the world, right? I mean that if, if it weren't for Justin Fields, scrambling ability, I don't think he would have made like NFL teams, but so like it can absolutely, like it is a positive thing to be able to scramble, but it's like using it as a crutch that that's when you get to be a problem. Um, it's, it's like, I, like when I was watching him, it was kind of flummoxing because like, you would watch him look at an open receiver, turn it down, not really understand why. And by the time you're done processing that, he's 35 yards downfield. He's juke two defenders and you, and it looks like he might score. Like, <laughs> you're like, well, I guess I can't take that away from you. But like, obviously, you know, one part of that is going to be a lot harder to translate to the NFL than the other. And it's not the good part of that. It's, you know, guys are faster in the NFL. You're not going to be housing 65 yarders all the time. Um, but that said, I think he gets a little bit too much flack for this eye dropping thing. It is a negative for sure, but he's a smart QB and he's an older QB. There, there are older QBs in this class. We're sort of at the tail end of the COVID kids that, you know, took their, their extra COVID year. Now they're, you know, 25, 24, and there, there's like 25 year olds in this draft. Uh, Jaden Daniels, I think will be 24 when the season, when his first season starts. So he's an older QB. And he's he's a fifth year player. He play he threw touchdowns to Brandon Ayuk in college. Like he played against Justin Herbert in college. Like he's he's been around for a while. So that's a concern that a lot of people have. And so when I see an older guy, those kinds of things, I've been using the term proxy analysis for that because you're not actually making a conclusion about a guy. You're making making a conclusion. You're you're, you're drawing a conclusion based on what guys like that tend to be, and you're kind of using age as a proxy for for an idea right that idea being that his game won't translate to the next level and the logic of that is well you know if he's 24 and he's dunking on a bunch of 19 year olds he might just be a way better athlete than everybody which won't be true at the next level so okay good question right will that translate to the next level and i think you can say yeah the scrambling for 75 yards difficult to see that translating to the next level unless you're you know an anthony richardson level a athlete then you kind of can say okay well that that guy actually is just going to still be a better athlete at the next level and nobody's going to be a better athlete than him cuz he's the best testing quarterback ever in the history of the sport uh not quite true of Jaden Daniels right um still I think I well he didn't run a lot of the tests but like not Anthony Richardson uh so you're looking for other kinds of QB and like the way that he sees the field to me is really impressive and this is going to be where I sort of veer off of consensus if you listen to other draft analysts they will all bring up that he didn't throw a, a lot over the middle so LSU's offense was based on a lot of fades and go balls, deep shots down the sideline to Brian Thomas as kind of a lot of his game and Malik neighbors as well. Although his game was a little bit more about like finding soft spots in zone and like converting yards after the catch and stuff like that, a little bit more all around, which is why he's going to be a higher draft pick. Um, but it was a lot of like he's a slot fade guy and slot fade is a great shot play in the NFL that will be there. You obviously can't make the whole plane out of that, but it's a skill and it's something that LSU sort of abused and spammed uh, with great success. So you didn't get a lot of stuff over the middle, but uh, for me at least like splitting middle of field open safeties on a post route, he has that throw, right? And I, I, I like the way that he sees the field. There are examples on my, I should have mentioned this way earlier in the show, my Patreon page, uh, patreon.com slash Luke Braun NFL. You can see my, my breakdowns of these guys and you can actually see film on that. This is a podcast. Most of the people listen on audio. If you're watching on YouTube, I can't put film up there both because it would alienate all my audio people. And also that's just like NFL and college football just wouldn't allow that. Um, but on, on Patreon, I can put that up for free and you just look at it so you, we can all learn together. So go look at that. Uh, but I'll do my best, right? What I like is when QBs throw against DB leverage, right? When you see a corner or a safety bearing down on a route, you're not throwing to your receiver anymore. You're throwing against that guy. You're trying to put the ball in a place where that guy can't get it and then trusting your receiver to run it down for you. 
that's the best way to do things. And Jaden Daniels does that trusted very good receivers to run it down. But even if he didn't have good receivers and those balls ended up incomplete, it would still be correct to throw it where the defender can't get it right. That's like an age old principle. Um, one of the other things you'll probably hear about Jaden Daniels is that uh, he doesn't protect himself. And this is a really like interesting point because sometimes he does. But what people are talking about is when he scrambles, there are a few low lights out there of him getting lit up like a cartoon character, just getting absolutely smoked. This doesn't bug me too much because one, teaching a guy how to slide is pretty trivial. It's not something you need to spend a whole lot of time on. You can get somebody to slide, tell them they're the franchise, really, you know, just have it be something that you remind them of every once in a while and they'll, they'll he'll, he'll figure that out. Um, but for two, taking hits that like look particularly violent versus standing in the pocket and like getting your knee twisted up, like the injury risk of those hits, I would say is exaggerated. And there's kind of like a physics lesson in that you get blown back five yards. All the inertia was spent moving you five yards, not actually going through your body. So like that actually does kind of soften the hit a little bit if you don't have, you know, the ground or another player that, you know, you're getting hit against. But where he does protect himself too much is when he actually is standing in the pocket and somebody's bearing down on him and he needs to like stand in and throw, he'll fall away from that thing. It'll be like a fadeaway jumper. He'll lose his base, he'll lose his accuracy, and he'll miss a lot of throws that way. Um, he also had a bunch of missed throws in the first game of the season against FSU, and then he cleaned things up a lot after that. So I, I kind of don't look at that game as particularly instructive. I, I think he kind of got over whatever was going on there. Um, but you like you'll see it in that game and you'll see that didn't get cleaned up throughout the season, which is why I'm bringing it up, that he'll sort of do the fadeaway jumper thing when pressure is coming. And that's an issue. And that's sort of a mentality, too. That's like not wanting to take a hit. But once he's out and out of the pocket and he's a runner, it's almost like the mentality flips and then it's hero ball. And you kind of want to change that. Like, okay, don't be a hero out in the open field. But when you're in the pocket, yeah, sometimes you got to stand and take the hit and, and, and actually just like huck that thing. So... That's, I think, something that might bother people. But for me, Jaden Daniels is a his accuracy is good for me. Uh, his the way he thinks, the way it looks like he's thinking, at least you kind of have to psychoanalyze and, and come to, you know, jump to co some conclusions when you're doing that. Guess what's in a guy's head. And at least the guess that I'm getting coming up with, I like a lot. And the running ability, while he does use it as a crutch, still reads to me as more positive than negative. I absolutely love Jaden Daniels. He's also almost certainly a commander. The betting odds are starting to reflect it. The reports have been pretty consistent with the occasional smoke about maybe they'll take J.J. McCarthy or whatever. Uh, but he's probably just a commie. So, uh, you know, congrats, commanders. You got the guy that I like a lot. Uh, but let's talk about a guy that honestly is probably the favorite to be the Vikings quarterback right now, at least if you look at the betting odds. Uh, and that's J.J. McCarthy. Today's episode of Locked On Vikings is brought to you by Monopoly Go. Monopoly, the classic board game that ruined your best friend's relationship with you in second grade. It's here and it's on your phone with a whole bunch of really fun twists. You can play on countless dynamic Monopoly boards, all the different themes and stuff that you love about Monopoly on your phone anytime, but you can do stuff like rob your friends. You just rob them. That's like, okay, that's fair game. And if you're not robbing your friends, you're not trying. Uh, you can also destroy their landmarks with a wrecking ball. And of course, charge rent if they land on your properties and all the kind of stuff that usually makes them angry with all kinds of other tools to bring out the worst villain inside of you uh, and engage it in a way that is absolutely sanctioned and encouraged. So get Monopoly Go and find the worst in yourself. <laughs> Now free on the App Store or Google Play. <laughs> Moving on with this one, uh, perhaps my most controversial take. What's well, probably everybody's most controversial take because he's a controversial QB. It's J.J. McCarthy. So we live in a world right now where trading up for Drake May or Jaden Daniels is going to be pretty hard, right? Jaden Daniels took the commanders at two is pretty locked, not 100% locked, but it's like pretty locked. Uh, and Drake May at number three is either a Patriot or a Viking Giants, maybe a dark horse to make that trade. Uh, but if it's not the Vikings and the Vikings are instead then saying, OK, Arizona Chargers, we're coming up to four or five. We're going to get you. Then the pick would almost certainly there be J.J. McCarthy. 
And that's not everybody's QB rankings. There are a lot of people that say, wait, whoa, whoa, whoa. I got Bo Nix above J.J. McCarthy. What's that? I got Mike Penix above J.J. McCarthy. What gives? We'll talk about those guys tomorrow, actually. But if you want to look at like the actual consensus, it's pretty big cliff between these those top four guys, Caleb and the three guys we're talking about today, and uh, Nix, Penix, Rattler, those guys. Pretty big cliff. So, so if they're trading up, it's almost certainly for McCarthy. And he's a very controversial quarterback. Um, because I think his evaluation is a little bit tough because there's a huge difference between people who watched him and came up with, you know, here's how he plays. Here's what I like about it. Here's what I don't like about it. And people who just do the proxy analysis, who say things, who try to logic their way through it and say things like, um, well, you know, Michigan ran the ball a lot. You know, he only passed like, like 16, 17 times a game. They must not trust him. And that's logic, right? That's like a, that's a deduction, but it's not an observation. It's um, it's a proxy, right? It's saying, well, you know, a guy didn't have a lot of passing volume, which is a proxy for he must be bad and and not trustworthy, and and they must have hated passing. Now, Michigan's offense drove me nuts. Uh, they had receivers running routes poorly. They had busts in the protection all the time. So you have that same concern where you're like, okay, who is calling the prots? Do you know who is, who did, did they know what they were supposed to be doing? Um, but it wasn't like as miscommunicating. It was just dudes getting the crap kicked out of them in pass pro. Cause these guys are all built to run block. That's why these Michigan linemen, they're all going to get drafted, but they're going to get drafted in day three because they can't pass block. And so if you just isolate out the pass plays, which is the exposure that I had. So maybe this is just coloring my thing because it wasn't I wasn't watching Michigan every Saturday on TV going, wow, they run the ball a lot. I was you just isolate. OK, don't pay attention to the run plays then. So you didn't do anything on the run plays. Always a handoff machine and nobody everybody can hand off. Yeah, agree. So we don't learn anything from the handoff plays. Get them out of the sample and just watch the pass plays. And if you just watch the pass plays, you can't to, to me, I get a different story. I get a story of a whole bunch of mess ups, a guy having to do a lot of scramble drills and uh, executing them well and finding things, you know, f- controlling chaos. You compare it to someone like Drake May who embraces the chaos. He becomes the chaos. He creates the chaos. But McCarthy chaos, when it's inflicted on him by some screw up elsewhere on the team, uh, he will want to rein it back in and turn it into something controllable. And that's a pretty sustainable way to play in the league. And I like J.J. McCarthy uh, for that reason. I don't like him as much as I like Daniels in May for a reason that I'll get to. But instead of a, a bad play turning into some kind of disaster, he'll be able to rein it back in into a controllable situation. And the improv gene with J.J. McCarthy is really there. There's something lately that's been bugging me that I've been seeing a lot, which is a Kirk Cousins comparison. And I think people just mean that they think J.J. McCarthy is mid, which like, just say that if that's what you think. But it, Kirk Cousins is a terrible comparison to J.J. McCarthy. This is a way different quarterback than what the Vikings have had for the last six years. The Vikings haven't had a scramble draw for the last six years. The, Kirk Cousins was not a guy that would escape the pocket, run around and find something like he, that was not his game. He would get rid of the ball when pressure was coming. That was his deal was to be a quick passer with the ball to mitigate that pressure. That was his response. Perfectly valid, but J.J. McCarthy's is not that. He'll hang on to it. He'll run around. He'll find that throw on the run. I love the way that he throws on the run. Uh, it's really good. And Michigan was a little bit more polished with that scramble drill. So uh, it, it was there. And he could, you know, it, to me, I got the sense of an improv gene holding a team together in a way that really nobody else on that team was doing. Even the guys that, you know, are going to like Roman Wilson, who are going to get drafted. Um, He can create some with his legs, not Jaden Daniels, like not even really like Caleb Williams or Drake May like, but it's there. It'll work right. You know, they ran a little option, I guess that tells you what it uh, that tells you that it's at least good enough. Um, And and I think if I were to look at like the timing issues to, to me, I saw JJ McCarthy rushing sometimes going kind of coming off of routes too quickly. Uh, and maybe I'm just not quite understanding what he's reading, which is, I mean, all I can do is guess, right? I don't have the playbook in front of me or anything when I'm watching. So maybe that's the case, but it just kind of seemed like he was like, you know, first read, second read, check down before anything had broken off before any, before anything had declared before the coverage it had, you know, really declared itself before the ma- the pattern matching had really sorted itself out. He's like already checking down. It's like, you kind of rushed that a little bit. And that might just be a response to pressure, getting him a little bit skittish and getting him to try to get the ball out a little bit too quickly. Um, and this is why I say like, if you want to compare him to a Vikings quarterback of old, Teddy Bridgewater, 
That was a huge Teddy Bridgewater issue. And the other thing he shares with Teddy Bridgewater is not really having a deep ball. <laughs> he can throw a post okay, uh, or like a seam stuff over the middle. But once it gets out to the sidelines, you have a lot of trouble. Uh, and for him, for, for McCarthy, if he can drive the ball, if he can really zip it through a tight window, that's where he's at his best. And I really like his footwork. I love the way that he works in the pocket. I love the way that he does keep his feet wide. So when it is time to move the pocket a little bit, it's a small stutter, very controlled step. So I think in terms of that, just, just that facet, he's my favorite in the class. Maybe, maybe I'd take Jaden Daniels, but like, I really like that. Certainly better than May, who's going to go higher than him for other reasons. But that's like something that I really like about JJ McCarthy. Um, and so that means that when it's time to step into something and drive and really zip it, he can get that zip on it. Uh, there's this really funny, so people say he has like a weak arm, which I think is because he has a bad deep ball. They just kind of say a weak arm, which is really lazy. Don't do that. Uh, but if for whatever it's worth, he did, uh, come up behind like one mile per hour behind Joe Milton from Tennessee, who has a like ridiculously strong arm, like the kind of, you know, 70 yards on a knee kind of thing. He also like, I don't think is draftable, but, <laughs> um, but Hey, big, strong arm. And JJ McCarthy was able to put that same zip on it because he has good throwing mechanics. Um, and he can get the torque on his body, he can get his hip all the way through. And that's what you want when you step into a throw. You want to see that hip rotation. You want to see that right step. You want to see everything open and out of the way and smooth. I've talked a lot about Cuban mechanics this off season. You can find a series of articles at wide left, all the Patreon videos, old locked ons. If you want to know more about it, I won't go too deep into the weeds today, but that's really, really good. But when it's time to put touch on it, when it's time to layer the football and like get it up and over somebody, get some air under it, suddenly he sprays them really bad, super erratic. And that's why I just, I can't put him in this top three thing. I can't say, oh, he's going to go second to, you know, the commanders. I can't buy any of that, but that's only one throw. That's only one area of the field. And I still think he's perfectly worth, uh, you know, making your franchise quarterback. If in a perfect world, I think picking him at 11 is a little bit more of appropriate value. Um, I see him as a mid first round guys, maybe even a little rich, but you're not really trying to get appropriate value with the quarterback thing thing and understanding that they have to trade up because the giants might be interested in him. You know, you got to get up past, past, uh, the giants. You got to get up, make sure the Broncos don't leapfrog you. I fully get it. And I fully endorse it. If that's the way the Vikings go, you're not going to hear a, a lot of complaining out of me. I like JJ McCarthy. I like how he improvises. I like how his, his mechanics work. Got to work on that deep ball. That's going to be the big thing. So, those are the three guys. There's, I think, probably, I would say like 95% chance I just talked about the Vikings first round pick uh, at some point. And, but there's still a chance that something else happens, right? That they don't get the trade up, that, you know, everything totally falls through at the last minute. Very much possible, very much still in the cards. So tomorrow we'll talk about guys like Penix and Knicks, maybe spare a little bit of a thought on guys like Rattler, talk about Caleb Williams out of like obligation, maybe even some D line stuff. Surprise things that can happen. Uh, that aren't necessarily the like chalk thing that have been that's been shouted at us for months that the Vikings are trading up. If it doesn't happen, what happens then? We'll get to all of that tomorrow. And also they will do it tomorrow. This is a draft tomorrow. We like we almost made it, everybody. So get excited. All right. Uh by the way, we're gonna be live on the Minnesota football party. So go to Locked On Minnesota Sports Channel uh to watch live with us because it's better than listening to Mel Kuyper say wrong things, because that's all he does now. So uh, enjoy that, and uh, I'll see you all tomorrow. And as always, skull.